Leviathan, or the matter, for me and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Book by Thomas Hobbes. Narrated by Andrew. Originally published in 1651. This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 31. Of the Kingdom of God by Nature. The scope of the following chapters. That the condition of mere nature, that is to say, of absolute liberty, such as is theirs, that neither are sovereigns nor subjects, is anarchy in the condition of war. That the precepts, by which men are guided to avoid that condition, are the laws of nature, that a commonwealth, without sovereign power, is but a word, without substance, and cannot stand. That subjects owe to sovereigns, simple obedience, in all things, wherein their obedience is not repugnant to the laws of God, I have sufficiently proved, in that which I have already written. There wants onely, for the entire knowledge of civil duty, to know what are those laws of God. For without that, a man knows not, when he is commanded anything by the civil power, whether it be contrary to the law of God, or not. And so, either by too much civil obedience, offends the divine majesty, or through fear of offending God, transgresses the commandments of the commonwealth. To avoid both these rocks, it is necessary to know what are the laws divine. And seeing the knowledge of all law, dependeth on the knowledge of the sovereign power, I shall say something in that which followeth, of the kingdom of God. Who are subjects in the kingdom of God? God is king, let the earth rejoice, saith the psalmist. Saul. 96. 1. And again, God is king though the nations be angry, and he that sitteth on the cherubims, though the earth be moved. Saul. 98. 1. Whether men will or not, they must be subject always to the divine power. By denying the existence, or providence of God, men may shake off their ease, but not their yoke. But to call this power of God, which extendeth itself not only to man, but also to beasts and plants, and bodies inanimate, by the name of kingdom, is but a metaphorical use of the word. For he only is properly said to reign, that governs his subjects, by his word, and by promise of rewards to those that obey it, and by threatening them with punishment that obey it not. Subjects therefore in the kingdom of God, are not bodies inanimate, nor creatures irrational, because they understand no precepts as his, nor atheists. Nor they that believe not that God has any care of the actions of mankind, because they acknowledge no word for his, nor have hope of his rewards, or fear of his threatenings. They therefore that believe there is a God that governeth the world, and hath given precepts, and propounded rewards, and punishments to mankind, are God's subjects. All the rest are to be understood as enemies. A threefold word of God, reason, revelation, prophecy. To rule by words requires that such words be manifestly made known. For else they are no laws, for to the nature of laws belongeth a sufficient and clear promulgation, such as may take away the excuse of ignorance which in the laws of men is but of one only kind, and that is, proclamation or promulgation by the voice of man. But God declareth his laws three ways, by the dictates of natural reason, by revelation, and by the voice of some man, to whom by the operation of miracles, he procureth credit with the rest. From hence there are he saith a triple word of God, rational, sensible, and prophetique, to which correspondeth a triple hearing, right reason, sense supernatural, and faith. As for sense supernatural, which consisteth in revelation, or inspiration, there have not been any universal laws so given, because God speaketh not in that manner, but to particular persons. And to divers men divers things. A twofold kingdom of God, natural and prophetic from the difference between the other two kinds of God's word, rational, and prophetic, there may be attributed to God, a twofold kingdom. Natural and prophetic, natural wherein he governeth as many of mankind as acknowledge his providence, by the natural dictates of right reason. In prophetique, wherein having chosen out one peculiar nation, the Jews, for his subjects, he governed them, and none but them, not only by natural reason, but by positive laws, which he gave them by the mouths of his holy prophets. Of the natural kingdom of God I intend to speak in this chapter. The right of God's sovereignty is derived from his omnipotence the right of nature, whereby God reigneth over men, and punisheth those that break his laws, is to be derived. 
not from his creating them, as if he required obedience, as of gratitude for his benefits, but from his irresistible power. I have formerly shown how the sovereign right are a seth from pact, to shew how the same right may arise from nature, requires no more, but to shew in what case it is never taken away. Seeing all men by nature had right to all things, they had right every one to reign over all the rest. But because this right could not be obtained by force, it concerned the safety of every one, laying by that right, to set up men, with sovereign authority, by common consent, to rule and defend them. Whereas if there had been any man of power irresistible, there had been no reason, why he should not by that power have ruled, and defended both himself, and them, according to his own discretion. To those therefore whose power is irresistible, the dominion of all men adhereth naturally by their excellence of power. And consequently it is from that power, that the kingdom over men, and the right of afflicting men at his pleasure, belongeth naturally to God Almighty, not as Creator and Gracious, but as Omnipotent. And though punishment be due for sin only, because by that word is understood affliction for sin, yet the right of afflicting is not always derived from men's sin, but from God's power. Sin not the cause of all affliction. This question, why evil men often prosper, and good men suffer adversity, has been much disputed by the Antiot, and is the same with this of ours. By what right God dispenseth the prosperities and adversities of this life? And is of that difficulty, as it hath shaken the faith, not only of the vulgar, but of philosophers, and which is more, of the saints, concerning the divine providence? How good, saith David, is the God of Israel to those that are upright in heart, and yet my feet were almost gone, my treadings had well nigh slipped. For I was grieved at the wicked, when I saw the ungodly in such prosperity. And Job, how earnestly does he expostulate with God, for the many afflictions he suffered? Notwithstanding his righteousness? This question in the case of Job, is decided by God himself, not by arguments derived from Job's sin, but his own power. For whereas the friends of Job drew their arguments from his affliction to his sin, and he defended himself by the conscience of his innocence, God himself taketh up the matter. And having justified the affliction by arguments drawn from his power, such as this, where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth, and the like, both approved Job's innocence, and reproved the erroneous doctrine of his friends. Conformable to this doctrine is the sentence of our Savior, concerning the man that was born blind, in these words, neither hath this man sinned, nor his fathers, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. And though it be said that death entrayed into the world by sin, by which is meant that if Adam had never sinned, he had never died. That is, never suffered any separation of his soul from his body, it follows not thence, that God could not justly have afflicted him, though he had not sinned. As well as he afflicteth other living creatures, that cannot sin. Divine Laws Having spoken of the right of God's sovereignty, as grounded only on nature, we are to consider next, what are the divine laws, or dictates of natural reason? Which laws concern either the natural duties of one man to another, or the honor naturally due to our divine sovereign? The first are the same laws of nature, of which I have spoken already in the fourteen. In fifteen, chapters of this treatise, namely, equity, justice, mercy, humility, and the rest of the moral virtues. It remaineth therefore that we consider, what precepts are dictated to men, by their natural reason only, without other word of God, touching the honor and worship of the divine majesty. Honor and worship what? Honor consisteth in the inward thought and opinion of the power and goodness of another, and therefore to honor God is to think as highly of his power and goodness as is possible. And of that opinion, the external signas appearing in the words and actions of men are called worship which is one part of that which the Latines understand by the word cultus. For cultus signifieth properly and constantly that labor which a man bestows on any thing, with a purpose to make benefit by it. Now those things whereof we make benefit are either subject to us, and the profit they yield, followeth the labor we bestow upon them as a natural effect. Or they are not subject to us, but answer our labor according to their own wills. In the first since the labor bestowed on the earth, is called culture, in the education of children a culture of their mindies. In the second sense, where men's wills are to be wrought to our purpose, not by force, but by complaisance, it signifieth as much as courting, that is, 
a winning of favor by good offices. As by praises, by acknowledging their power, and by whatsoever is pleasing to them from whom we look for any benefit. And this is properly worship, in which sense publicola is understood for a worshipper of the people, and cultus day, for the worship of God. Several signas of honor. From internal honor, consisting in the opinion of power and goodness, arise three passions, love, which hath reference to goodness, and hope, and fear, that relate to power, and three parts of external worship, praise, magnifying, and blessing, the subject of praise being goodness. The subject of magnifying and blessing being power and the effect there of felicity. Praise and magnifying are significant both by words and actions. By words, when we say a man is good or great. By actions, when we thank him for his bounty and obey his power. The opinion of the happiness of another can only be expressed by words. Worship natural and arbitrary. There be some signs of honor, both in attributes and actions, that be naturally so, as amongst attributes, good, just, liberal, and the like. And amongst actions, prayers, thanks, and obedience. Others are so by institution, or custom of men, and in sometimes and places are honorable, and others dishonorable. And others indifferent, such as are the gestures and salutation, prayer, and thanksgiving, in different times and places, differently used. The former is natural, the later arbitrary worship. Worship commanded and free. And of arbitrary worship, there be two differences, for sometimes it is a commanded, sometimes voluntary worship, commanded, when it is such as he requireth, who is worshipped. Free, when it is such as the worshipper thinks fit. When it is commanded, not the words or gestures, but the obedience is the worship. But when free, the worship consists in the opinion of the beholders, for if to them the words or actions by which we intend honor seem ridiculous, intending to contumely, they are not worship. Because a signa is not a signa to him that giveth it, but to him to whom it is made, that is, to the spectator. Worship public and private. Again, there is a public and a private worship. Public is the worship that a commonwealth performeth as one person. Private is that which a private person exhibiteth. Public, in respect of the whole commonwealth, is free, but in respect of particular men it is not so. Private is in secret free, but in the sight of the multitude it is never without some restraint, either from the laws or from the opinion of men, which is contrary to the nature of liberty. The end of worship. The end of worship amongst men is power. For where a man seeth another worshipped, he supposeth him powerful, and is the readier to obey him, which makes his power greater. But God has no ends. The worship we do him proceeds from our duty, and is directed according to our capacity, by those rules of honor, that reason dictateth to be done by the weak to the more potent men. In hope of benefit, for fear of damage, or in thankfulness for good already received from them. Attributes of Divine Honor that we may know what worship of God is taught us by the light of nature, I will begin with his attributes. Where, first, it is manifest, we ought to attribute to him existence, for no man can have the will to honor that, which he thinks not to have any being. Secondly, that those philosophers, who said the world, or the soul of the world was God, spake unworthily of him, and denied his existence, for by God is understood the cause of the world. And to say the world is God, is to say there is no cause of it, that is, no God. Thirdly, to say the world was not created, but eternal, seeing that which is eternal has no cause, is to deny there is a God. Fourthly, that they who attributing as they think, ease to God, take from him the care of mankind, take from him his honor, for it takes away men's love and fear of him. Which is the root of honor? Fifthly, in those things that signify greatness and power, to say he is finite, is not to honor him, for it is not a signa of the will to honor God, to attribute to him less than we can. And finite is less than we can, because to finite it is easy to add a more. Therefore to attribute figure to him is not honor, for all figure is finite. Nor to say we conceive, and imagine, or have an idea of him, in our mind, for whatsoever we conceive is finite. Not to attribute to him parts, or totality, which are the attributes only of things finite. Nor to say he is this, or that place, 
for whatsoever is in place is bounded and finite. Nor that he is moved or resteth, for both these attributes ascribe to him place. Nor that there be more gods than one. Because it implies them all finite, for there cannot be more than one infinite. Nor to ascribe to him, unless metaphorically, meaning not the passion, but the effect, passions that partake of grief, as repentance, anger, mercy, or of want, as appetite, hope, desire. Or of any passive faculty, for passion is power limited by somewhat else. And therefore when we ascribe to God a will, it is not to be understood, as that of man, for a rational appetite, but as the power, by which he effecteth everything. Likewise when we attribute to him sight, and other acts of sense, as also knowledge, and understanding. Which in us is nothing else, but a tumult of the mind, raised by external things that prey to the organical parts of man's body, for there is no such thing in God. And being things that depend on natural causes, cannot be attributed to him. He that will attribute to God, nothing but what is warranted by natural reason, must either use such negative attributes as infinite, eternal, incomprehensible, or superlatives as most high, most great, and the like, or indefinite as good, just, holy, creator. And in such sense, as if he meant not to declare what he is, for that were to circumscribe him within the limits of our fancy, but how much we admire him, and how ready we would be to obey him. Which is a signa of humility, and of a will to honor him as much as we can, for there is but one name to signify our conception of his nature, and that is, I am. And but one name of his relation to us, and that is God, in which is contained Father, King, and Lord. Actions that are signas of divine honor. Concerning the actions of divine worship, it is a most general precept of reason that they be signas of the intention to honor God. Such as are, first, prayers, for not the carvers, when they made images, were thought to make them gods, but the people that prayed to them. Secondly, thanksgiving, which differeth from prayer in divine worship, no otherwise than that prayers precede and thanks succeed the benefit. The in both of the one and the other, being to acknowledge God, for author of all benefits, is well past, is future. Thirdly, gifts, that is to say, sacrifices and oblations, if they be of the best, are signas of honor, for they are thanksgivings. Fourthly, not to swear by any but God, is naturally a signa of honor, for it is a confession that God only knoweth the heart, and that no man's wit or strength can protect a man against God's vengeance on the perjured. Fifthly, it is a part of rational worship, to speak considerately of God, for it argues a fear of him, and fear is a confession of his power. Hence followeth, that the name of God is not to be used rashly, and to no purpose, for that is as much, as in vain, and it is to no purpose. Unless it be by way of oath, and by order of the commonwealth, to make judgment certain, or between commonwealths, to avoid war. And that disputing of God's nature is contrary to his honor, for it is supposed, that in this natural kingdom of God, there is no other way to know anything, but by natural reason. That is, from the principles of natural science. Which are so far away from teaching us anything of God's nature, as they cannot teach us our own nature, nor the nature of the smallest creature living. And therefore, when men out of the principles of natural reason, dispute of the attributes of God, they but dishonor him. For in the attributes which we give to God, we are not to consider the signification of philosophical truth, but the signification of pious intention, to do him the greatest honor we are able. From the one of which consideration have preceded the volumes of disputation about the nature of God, that tend not to his honor, but to the honor of our own wits and learning, and are nothing else but inconsiderate and vain abuses of his sacred name. Sixthly, in prayers, thanksgivings, offerings, and sacrifices, it is a dictate of natural reason that they be every one in his kind the best and most significant of honor. As for example, that prayers and thanksgiving be made in words and phrases, not sudden, nor light, nor plebeian, but beautiful and well composed, for else we do not God as much honor as we can. And therefore the heathens did absurdly to worship images for gods, but they're doing it in verse and with music, both of voice and instruments, was reasonable. Also that the beasts they offered in sacrifice, and the gifts they offered, and their actions in worshipping, were full of submission, 
and commemorative of benefits received, was according to reason. As proceeding from an intention to honor him. Seventhly, reason directeth not only to worship God in secret, but also, and especially, in public, and in the sight of men, for without that, that which an honor is most acceptable, the procuring others to honor him, is lost. Lastly, obedience to his laws, that is, in this case to the laws of nature, is the greatest worship of all. For his obedience is more acceptable to God than sacrifice, so also to set light by his commandments, is the greatest of all contumelies. And these are the laws of that divine worship, which natural reason dictateth to private men. Public worship consisteth in uniformity. But seeing a commonwealth is but one person, it ought also to exhibit to God but one worship, which then it doth, when it common death it to be exhibited by private men, publicly. And this is public worship, the property whereof, is to be uniform, for those actions that are done differently, by different men, cannot be said to be a public worship. And therefore, where many sorts of worship be allowed, proceeding from the different religions of private men, it cannot be said there is any public worship, nor that the commonwealth is of any religion at all. All attributes depend on the law as civil. And because words, and consequently the attributes of God, have their signification by agreement and constitution of men. Those attributes are to be held significative of honor, that men intend shall so be. And whatsoever may be done by the wills of particular men, where there is no law but reason, may be done by the will of the commonwealth, by laws civil. And because a commonwealth hath no will, nor makes no laws, but those that are made by the will of him, or them that have the sovereign power. It followeth, that those attributes which the sovereign ordaineth, in the worship of God, for signas of honor, ought to be taken and used for such, by private men in their public worship. Not all actions. But because not all actions are signas by constitution. But some are naturally signas of honor, others of contumely. These later, which are those that men are ashamed to do in the sight of them their reverence, cannot be made by humane power a part of divine worship. Nor the former, such as are decent, modest, humble behavior, ever be separated from it. But whereas there be an infinite number of actions and gestures of an indifferent nature, such of them as the commonwealth shall ordain to be publicly and universally in use, as signas of honor, and part of God's worship, are to be taken and used for such by the subjects. And that which is said in the scripture, it is better to obey God than men, hath place in the kingdom of God by pact, and not by nature. Natural Punishments Having thus briefly spoken of the natural kingdom of God, and his natural laws, I will add a only to this chapter a short declaration of his natural punishments. There is no action of man in this life, that is not the beginning of so long a chain of consequences, as no humane providence is high enough to give a man a prospect to the end. And in this chain, there are linked together both pleasing and unpleasing events. In such manner, as he that will do anything for his pleasure, must engage himself to suffer all the pains annexed to it. And these pains are the natural punishments of those actions, which are the beginning of more harm than good. And hereby it comes to pass, say, that intemperance is naturally punished with diseases, rashness, with mischances, injustice, with the violence of enemies, pride, with ruin. Cowardice, with oppression, negligent government of princes, with rebellion, and rebellion, with slaughter. Foreseeing punishments are consequent to the breach of laws, natural punishments must be naturally consequent to the breach of the laws of nature. And therefore follow them as their natural not arbitrary effects. The conclusion of the second part. And thus far a concerning the constitution, nature, and right of sovereigns, and concerning the duty of subjects, derived from the principles of natural reason. And now, considering how different this doctrine is, from the practice of the greatest part of the world, especially of these western parts, that have received their moral learning from Rome, and Athens, and how much depth of moral philosophy is required, and them that have the administration of the sovereign power. I am at the point of believing this my labor, as useless, and the commonwealth of Plato. For he also is of opinion that it is impossible for the disorders of state, and change of governments by civil war, ever to be taken away, till sovereigns be philosophers. But when I consider again, that the science of natural justice is the only science necessary for sovereigns, and their principal ministers. 
and that they need not be charged with the sciences mathematical, as by Plato they are, further, than by good laws to encourage men to the study of them. And that neither Plato, nor any other philosopher hitherto, hath put into order, and sufficiently, or probably proved all the theorems of moral doctrine, that men may learn thereby. Both how to govern, and how to obey. I recover some hope, that one time or other, this writing of mine, may fall into the hands of a sovereign, who will consider it himself, for it is short, and I think clear, without the help of any interested or envious interpreter. And by the exercise of entire sovereignty, in protecting the public teaching of it, convert this truth of speculation into the utility of practice. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.